Hi, today's video is about the Newtone IMA 516 amplifier. The 516 amplifier, or I should be more correct, the IMA 516 amplifier, because there was an earlier IM 516, are both descendants of the original model 470 amplifier that Newtone came out with in the early 1960s. And the 516 amplifier had three different systems that it could be used with. In a residential voice only intercom system application it would be called a communicom system and it would give you room to room communication and the ability to talk to up to three entry door stations. It does also have a low level radio or music connection option here which are the little blue and white wires. It could also be used in an apart, a small apartment house or what they used to call a patio home system which would be a small group of townhouses maybe four or six units and in those applications it would be referred to as a direct to com 3 apartment house system and the difference is not the amplifier at all it's simply the type of remote stations or apartment speakers that would be connected to it in a direct to com 3 system it only allows for communication from the apartment speaker to the entry door there is no dedicated door release part of the amplifier, although door release was an option on the speaker, but it would be wired in separately. It's not technically part of the intercom system. Uh, the door release switch would be on the remote station in the apartment just as a convenience. And then it also could be used as a general purpose background music amplifier that could be connected to a low level audio output of an intercom system and the application typically for that would be something like perhaps it was a veterinarian office or a doctor's office and they wanted to have intercom from communication from the receptionist desk to the different exam rooms or something like that but they also wanted to have some background music in the patient waiting area but of course you don't want the patients to be bothered with the communication over the intercom so you would connect the low level music output of the intercom master station to a 516 amplifier which would then have some speakers connected to it that would be in the waiting area and it would play background music and not be interrupted by the intercom. In the 30 years I've been doing this, I don't think I've ever seen anyone actually do that. So it was primarily either a residential intercom system or a small apartment or patty home intercom system. The IMA 516 is a relatively simple design using for the most part all very common and easy to find off the shelf components. The biggest problem with these is time. It's not uncommon for an amplifier like this to be in someone's home and to go for 25 or more years before it requires any type of rebuilding or repair and the primary problems that occur to them is you'll notice one day you'll start to have a low level AC background hum on the speakers the system will most likely still operate at that point but if you wait long enough the hum will become louder and louder and eventually turn into a fairly pr predominant buzz that you hear through the system all the time and at that point it may be unusable either from an electronics point of view or just because the buzz is so loud you can't really speak over it. If you get to an amplifier like this and rebuild it early on, you'll have less problems with it than if you wait until it becomes inoperable. For the most part, commonly, if you get to an amplifier like this early on, mostly what needs to be done with it, it needs to have the capacitors that are spread throughout the board replaced because they simply fail due to age. So let's take a quick look at the board and I'll show you sort of the general layout and some things to be aware of. The layout of the IMA 516 is fairly straightforward. This particular amplifier was made towards the end of 1992. If you have one of these because this was a very long production model, you might see some slight differences in the layout or the components because it was updated periodically as time went on, but fundamentally they're all pretty much the same. So the way it's laid out is simple. There's an access hole here in the center of the board and there is a hole, matching hole in the mounting base and that's typically where the wiring would come through from the remote stations and the transformer and so forth and then 
the correct wires would be connected to the individual screw standoffs around the center and they're all labeled as to what their use is. On this side over here we have AC in. This is where the wires from the remotely mounted power transformer uh, would be connected. An IMA 516 requires a Newtone 301N or 301T transformer which is rated at 16 volts at 30 watts. And then you have the door speaker connections here, the out, the input audio or intercom communication inputs here, the output terminals are here, and over here you have two terminals that are marked as chime. Uh, the 516 amplifier does not include any kind of built-in chime or chime module feature. This was a design that came from the 60s where you could have an externally or separately mounted door chime tied in to the intercom system. In the earliest days it would have been a mechanical chime with small electronic coil pickups next to the vibrating tone bars and the pickups would pick up the vibrations of the tone bars, send it to these terminals and it would be, these are input terminals and it would amplify it up and send it out through the stations. Starting in the late 70s, Newtone came out with a variety of electronic musical chimes and those chimes were designed to be connected. They had output terminals and could be connected to these terminals also and then the chime music tones or songs could be heard throughout the system. So these are not terminals where you connect a push button. These are not terminals where you connect a separate transformer like you're powering some chime that's built in. So if we look at the general layout of the board, it's, des it's designed and divided up into different sections that make a lot of sense. This area of the board here is primarily power supply. This section over here is amplification. Here we have gain controls for the intercom. Here we have circuitry for the low level radio input. And right in the middle of it, we have one integrated circuit. There's not a lot of really a lot of solid state parts in this. And if we look at it, it's pretty straightforward. In the power supply section down here, you have one of the only two transistors in the entire amplifier. And this is for voltage regulation in the power supply, as is the one diode here. And down here, you have one Zener diode. So the things that typically go wrong with these beyond aging capacitors is if the system is left in a failed state for a long period of time, the power supply section will suffer. And primarily what will happen is, or what should be checked thoroughly is, the one Zener diode down here to make sure it's still within spec. And also this transistor of course has to be good, otherwise there's no power regulation for the amplifier. Up here in the intercom section of the amplifier, we have the second transistor in the, in the design, which is Q102. Q102 is the intercom amplification transistor. It's not generally a problem, but sometimes they will fail, or if not failed altogether, sometimes they become noisy. You'll get a small amount of random static uh, noise when the intercom is in use or if it's in listening mode and sometimes this transistor simply gets noisy. It's a fairly common transistor. It's not hard to find so it's easy to replace. Here we have the one of the few integrated circuits. There's only two of those also. This is Z101. This is a quad bilateral switch. It's not an amplifier IC which a lot of people ask me if it is or not. You can look up the number on it and find out that it's not. This simply organizes the audio inputs for the amplifier. Again, very rarely ever a problem. One of the most predominant things you'll see on the board is this round silver can with all of the different colored wires coming out of it. This is an audio matching transformer. Uh, again, very rarely a problem, although I think in the last 20 years I have replaced one of these. And that was on a system that the fella tried to do some kind of unusual audio hookup to it that apparently didn't work. And so that was a problem, but this is a passive component and it's very rarely a problem. The area that these 
amplifiers do tend to have problems and sometimes a challenge in repairing is down here in the amplification section of the amplifier. Down here we have an amplification IC. This is a TDA 2003. On earlier models it was a TDA 2002. The 3 was just an improved version of the IC. And this is basically a fairly simple 10 watt amplifier IC that was most commonly used in things like car radios. You'll see a lot of different information about this depending on where you look and also what it says in the new tone service manual but the most honest estimate is it is a 10 watt amplifier these are a little tricky to find nowadays and it is a fairly um, specific component you cannot replace it with some generic replacement i've never found anything else that really works in the same way one of the things you'll find is on some of the earlier versions of this amplifier down here you can see there's a little green ceramic capacitor. I think it's across leads one and three. Earlier versions with the two TDA 2002 don't have this. This was added to help cut down an oscillation that could occur in the amplifier IC which makes it get hot. Uh, if you have a failure in either the amplifier IC or in the voltage regulator transistor, they have these aluminum heat sinks that they're mounted to, and typically these will become very, very hot if either one of these components have failed. So since these are all what are, would be commonly referred to as jelly bean parts, which means they're commonly available and they cost about what a jelly bean costs. It's easier if you have a suspicion that either one of these are bad to just replace them along with the other components in it. If you're a do-it-yourselfer or you have an inclination to work on a piece of equipment that you own, this is a reasonable choice to start with. It's a, it's one, it's a one board design. It's all through hole mounted parts soldered on the back side. Everything here is relatively available and the service manual for it is quite extensive. It shows you how it should be installed, how to make adjustments, and the different variations of the design for the most part. Newton was not really good about updating service manuals. If in doubt and you believe that your amplifier is all original, replace components with similar components that are on the actual amplifier even if the information in the service manual is somewhat different. Probably the biggest problem with these amplifiers other than time are how they are set up or adjusted when they're installed on an entire system. 10 watts is a lot of power for a little voice only intercom system. The speaker cones in the remote stations are only three and a half inch cones, the same size as an entry door station, and they don't like to be overdriven. In most applications, there is no low level music connected to the amplifier, so this is actually the low level music or gain adjustment. It regulates how much of the input signal is being fed into the amplifier. If yours isn't using this, it it's not relevant. You can leave it set anywhere. There's nothing connected to it, so it doesn't matter. But this one over here is the intercom volume gain adjustment, and this is very important. The biggest problem that I see on these systems is this is set way, way, way too high, and therefore the sound coming out of the remote speakers would be way, way, way too loud, and then they're turned down, and the fidelity and the clarity of the communication suffered because the signal is overdriven. So let me show you how we set these up and sort of a good rule of thumb. So here we're looking at the intercom volume adjustment pot and you can see it's sort of a two piece arrangement. You have the body of the pot here and then the blue adjusting wheel here. There is actually a slot in the blue adjusting wheel that you can put a small screwdriver to rotate it which is what I'm gonna do here to keep my fingers out of the shot so you can actually see it. And what you can see here is right here, there's a little blue tab that's part of the adjusting wheel and this would be your indexing tab so you have some idea of where it's actually set. And if you rotate the, the adjustment pot so the tab rolls up towards the top of the amplifier, this is the top. If you roll it all the way up to the top, like this, it's now set at approximately zero. What you want to do, the rule of thumb that I've always followed is, if you look right here, you can see on the metal part of the body of the pot, there's this little metal tab right here that's folded over 
and that's what holds the pot together. If you start with the blue adjusting tab set at that folded over tab, that's a really good starting point. Now this is considering the fact that your remote stations, regardless of how many you have, should be set at full to start with. So you set all of your remote stations to full, you set the blue adjusting tab towards the bent over metal tab, and then you try the system and see if you have enough volume. If it's too loud, of course, you turn it down. If it's not quite loud enough, you simply turn it up a little bit. If you set it up this way, you'll find a small adjustment of the blue wheel will make a huge difference in the amount of volume that you get. What you don't want is a situation, which I see in most people's houses, where the blue tab is set way up like this, we're well over halfway now, and that is too much gain for the amplifier. It distorts the amplification. It also makes the remote speakers way too loud, and then you turn them down, and that just complicates things. So the rule is always simply as little gain as needed to give you the amount of volume that you need out of the remote speakers while they're turned up. And that's really all there is to the Newtone IMA 516 amplifier. If you have one of these in your home and it's beginning to hum or it's been humming for a long time and you've simply turned down the speakers so you don't have to listen to the hum, it would be a good project. You can either send it to us and I'll repair it for you. Uh, these are not terribly expensive to rebuild or if you're inclined to and you're a little bit handy, you might be able to repair it yourself. So that's all for today. I hope you found this video to be interesting and helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. If you like our YouTube channel and you find our videos to be interesting and you learn something from them, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our channel as this video are both ad-free, ad and if you subscribe to it, we would appreciate it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.